fantastic workshop. I'm really looking forward to spending the week talking about multifunctional nanofibers, carbon materials, and hopefully some others as well. So Adam has done a, a great job um, outlining the process and um, setting up our initial models for, for network um, pictures. And I had a little movie here, which I hope I can play. So what I'm going to do is, is talk a bit more about the models that we've um, looking at for uh, nanotube uh, assemblies and building up to this is going to be the, the sort of finale of my talk, which is a, a model we built of a large scale uh, network undergoing tensile failure. And what we want to do is, is to try and understand things like the effect of orientation and bundle size on the properties, both mechanical and electrical, although I'll be focusing mostly on mechanical in this talk on, on these things. So to address the, the challenge that was laid out by the, the plenary speaker of, of how do we realize the properties of individual tubes in a macro assembly. So one of the key things, as has already been mentioned, is alignment. And um, this is a, a nice study which uh, John Bulmer, when he was in Cambridge, led, uh, which is a, a meta-analysis of nearly 300 different papers summarizing the effect of alignment of various different kinds of carbon-based structures from graphite intercalation compounds, carbon fibers, few and uh, single walled nanotube fibers, and so on. Um, summarizing all of these results and trying to see uh, in this case, just the effect on tensile strength and conductivity of having unaligned versus aligned structures. So you can see there's a lot of variation between different types of uh, materials synthesized in different labs. But the take home message is that alignment helps in all cases to boost strength and conductivity. And we have these benchmarks here, these uh, green lines, which are the things that we're trying to target. So for example, for electrical conductivity, we have copper up here, which is just tantalizingly out of reach at the moment for even the best kind of materials, but if we, if we hit this benchmark, we'll be uh, really able to claim a major advance. And in mechanical properties, we're already rivaling, if not exceeding, the properties of the, uh, the best synthetic polymer fibers out, out there. So obviously, we, we know alignment is important, but I wanted to highlight that it's not obvious why it's important. I mean, you could say, of, of course, it's important because nanotubes are anisotropic materials. It makes sense if we orient them then we get better properties in the alignment direction. But alignment can have lots of effects, both direct and indirect. So one of the things I want to focus on in this talk is maybe the indirect effects of alignment. So for example, the effect of alignment on bundle size, or, or maybe the number of junctions per unit length along the fiber. There are a lot of things which you can't just explain by, by anisotropy alone. So incidentally, if you're interested in the study, there is an interactive uh, website now. You can go and interrogate this database that John built and also submit your own papers. If you publish new data, you can um, put those on this site here and we can continue building up this database as a, as a resource for the field. Okay, so again, other speakers have summarized this very well, so I'll, I'll just look at this briefly, but there are, there are lots of ways that you can affect alignment of uh, CNTs, and in our case, the direct spinning. This is uh, a little bit difficult to do because we're spinning from uh, a dilute gel from a gas phase, so in the past, we played around with things like changing the winding rate, uh, changing the gas flow rate, but there's not that many knobs you can tune here to, to affect the alignment directly. If you're spinning from forests, obviously you have a little bit more control over this, and probably the nicest techniques are these liquid state spinning, um, starting with the coagulation spinning, and then also acid spinning, as has been mentioned many times. And here, um, because you're, you're spinning essentially from a, from a gel state or a, a, a liquid crystalline mesophase, you can really have a lot of control over the alignment, and that's why generally these, these wet spun fibers tend to have slightly better properties um, in the as received state than the dry spun fibers. However, there are some strategies, and Adam's just mentioned one of them. Um, this is uh, the field alignment work, which is a new technique which we, we like now to try and dial up different types of orientation within the furnace. And this is important because. Um, as you're aligning these things, if, if you wait until they're outside of the furnace here, they've already stuck together, and it's very difficult to change the alignment of the tubes once they're actually in the fibre form. So applying the field in situ in the furnace is, is a really important technique. And as Adam mentioned, we think the reason for this is because of a stiffening effect, which increases the coupling between the electric field and the, the nanotube. So you need that AC to be able to, to do it. So we've been thinking a lot about alignment, I mean, probably a little bit too much actually, but this is, this is um, a summary of, of our insights over the last few years. So most people know um, 
the, the good way to, to measure alignment is by looking at the moments of the orientation distribution function. So this is basically regarding the, the nanotubes as, as rods and you characterize their uh, deviation from a, uh, an axis here. Usually we're, we're assuming axis symmetry here. And you can do this either in three dimensions for a fiber or if you're measuring orientation using x-rays. And sometimes people make films or they look at uh, electron microscope images of the thing. So you're looking at a two-dimensional orientation distribution function. But what people often don't realize is that there, there are different methods of characterizing those orientation distributions. So the point I want to make is that whether or not your orientation distribution is in two dimensions or three dimensions affects the way that you characterize it. And uh, the orientation distributions here are written in terms of this function of theta here for the 3D case and phi, the azimuthal angle in the plane. And they have different normalization constants because these angles behave differently in two dimensions and three dimensions. So to cut a long story short, you'll see in this talk, I'm talking mostly about this T2 alignment parameter, which Adam mentioned. This is um, a function of the cosine of this angle here, and it's the lowest uh, even order moment of the orientation distribution in two dimensions. And this is the thing that measures the amount of uniaxial orientation in the plane. Slightly different from this thing, which you'll see in the liquid crystal literature and maybe in polymer fibers, this is P2. This measures the uh, lowest even order moment in three dimensions. So if you try and calculate one of these uh, for the wrong dimensionality of orientation distribution, you're going to get a measure of alignment which is, which is wrong, sometimes by as much as 80%. So it matters which one of these you're using. And if you want to find out more about that, you can see our, our recent paper. We also have a Python script called FiberCop, which calculates these orientation parameters for you uh, from 2D and, and three-dimensional data. Well, what's really exciting is a recent result from one of my PhD students, Philip Clos, who's actually found uh, a closed form mathematical relationship between orientation distributions in two dimensions and 3D. And this is summarized in this picture here on, on the left. So I'm imagining here a distribution of fibers, let's call them nanotubes. So this is your full uh, three dimensional picture. So let's say you could measure directly the 3D orientation distribution that's shown here. And it's usually um, axisymmetric and it's non-polar. So it's non-orientable, so we're only looking at the even order moments. And then this is the equivalent two-dimensional picture, which is maybe if you take a section through this or you just look at the surface, and the corresponding two-dimensional orientation distribution is shown here. So there's actually a way that you can transform between these two things shown by this function p and an inverse function, and it's an integral transform, and the maths of this is rather complicated, so I'm not going to go into it here, but it's summarized in this, in this paper that we just put up on the archive. But it turns out if you know um, several of these moments from the, um, either the, the 3D or the 2D orientation distribution function, you can calculate the forward and reverse transforms. So in other words, if you measure the two-dimensional orientation distribution, you can then work backwards to what the 3D one should be or vice versa. And, and this is an exact relationship. Uh, it only assumes axis symmetry, but apart from that, it's, it's exact. And it converges very, very quickly. So um, this is the, the matrix transform. It's just a set of uh, order parameters here in 2D. Uh, these are these Chebyshev polynomials. And then on the, on the left-hand side, these are the, um, the Legendre, Legendre polynomials in 3D. And you have a matrix here which converts one set to the other. So in other words, if you want to calculate, say, T2 in the plane, if you know uh, P2 and P4, P6 and so on, you can just take a series and, and get directly the, the 2D parameter and vice versa, you can do that in 3D. And the convergence is very, very quick. So if you only have two terms here, you can get within about 1% of the bulk measured value. So this is a, a very useful relationship if you want to measure a 2D slice and then infer what the corresponding 3D orientation distribution would be. So this is by way of a long preamble, but in, in this talk, I'm gonna be mostly focusing on the two, T2 two-dimensional order parameter, but bear in mind with this technique, we can easily get to the 3D case as well. So, getting back to the main topic of my talk, what's the problem with scaling up morphology? Well, as many of you know, the, the, the fibres that come out of your process, they're too thin really to be used in applications like uh, cables uh, directly, so we have to usually think about clever ways of structuring these to make them bigger. In our group, we, we tend to make sheets which can roll up to make these ropes, or we put multiple microfibres together to make a tow. But as you can see from these pictures, these, these structures are far from ideal. They have voids in them, they have defects, and uh, stresses and currents don't easily get from one nanotube or one bundle to the other. 
And the result is that, for example, if you look at something like electrical conductivity in here, I'm looking at specific conductivity just to get rid of the effect of density. So this is uh, electrical conductivity divided by bulk density, and I'm looking at this as a function of linear density or fibre diameter. What you see is that uh, as you go from fibres of fractions of a tex up to, say, tens or hundreds of tex, then your conductivity goes down by about a factor of two. And the conductivity for the microfibers was already not very good anyway. So this, this, is, uh, this is not great. So we think we can understand a little bit uh, why that happens from the modeling. This is just a very simple finite element model that one of my students, Philip uh, McEwen, set up, where you imagine that the bundles here are these concentric cylinders. And in fact, you can just reduce this, this model to an axisymmetric cylindrical model where you have your, um, each, each one of these colored cylinders here represents a, a bundle which is then surrounded by other <coughs> bundles. And as you increase the uh, relative density here, this is the relative conductivity compared to a single bundle, and it just drops off here. Um, this number is the ratio of the actual conductivity to the transverse conductivity. So in the case where you have a completely isotropic conductivity, obviously there's no drop off, but because these structures are asymmetric, they're, they're much more conductive in their fiber direction than in the transverse direction, you see that the conductivity as you increase linear density drops off a lot. And that's pretty much exactly what we see experimentally. There's also even an effect of electrode size. So this is not often well known, but if you're measuring uh, electrical conductivity of, of uh, fibers, the size of your electrodes that are in contact with the fiber matters. So this is looking at the um, current distribution through uh, one of these finite element models. Just by varying the size of the electrodes, you can see that uh, it makes quite a big difference um, in terms of how far the current penetrates into the fiber. So without specifying your setup and, and the size of your electrodes, you're going to measure a different conductivity for your fiber. And it can make quite a big difference here. This is showing um, if the electrodes are 10% of the fiber contact area, um, going down to 1%, you, you could get an effective reduction of conductivity by 50%, even though there's no difference in your fiber. It's just simply the, the size of the electrodes. So all of these things you, you have to be careful about. So in order to understand this, then we want to build up some models. And um, Adam already showed a few pictures of, of these, but I'm going to start just by, by, by showing how we build these up from scratch. So we want a, a model of um, a nanotube, which we can scale up and, and use to, to look at these large scale fibers. And we started out by just taking um, a coarse grained model where you have these segments connected by harmonic springs and they have a bending force and a twisting force which is defined between them. But they also interact by van der Waals forces, so they're sticky. And rather than just describe the van der Waals forces by these individual atomic site site interactions, we integrate them along the length of the tube. And this idea was first uh, expressed by Volkov and, and Ziegler, who published a paper back in 2010. Um, we took this implementation and, to be fair, we, we um, made it faster and, and ironed out some of the bugs so that it was a rather unstable when we first used the, the implementation in LAMPS. But we now have um, some, some pair potentials here defined in LAMPS, so if you're using this code here, you can just take these directly and, and use them yourselves if you want to, and the parameters are given in this paper here. And what it does is it just describes this nice, smooth interaction um, this is looking along the length, so there's no rippling because of the atoms. This is just integrated uh, smoothly along, the, along the, a tube. So, as Adam showed, the simulations lead to um, bundle formation, and this is just uh, looking at a couple of tubes which are crossed at some initial angle here, and as time goes on, they zip together. So there's some critical angle at which they need to cross before they then zip. Another feature that's been shown here is the fact that this model is adaptive. So the um, orange regions here, these are fine grained. These blue regions are slightly more coarse grained. And then when we're far away from the junction, the, the coarse graining increases to a large degree. So this just allows us to speed up the simulations a little bit. And uh, we're measuring here the bundling parameter, so the amount of tube in contact with the other tube as a function of time. And as the critical angle increases, then the, the bundling time here is, 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 is um, takes longer as those, uh, as those tubes take more time to reorient. So what we learned from that is, um, again, that there's, there's two different regimes. There's this regime where they tend to rotate together, and then once they've come to a certain critical angle, then you get the zipping effect. And in fact, this can be viewed just as the reverse of fracture. So if you're familiar with things like the Griffith criterion for fracture, so here you have a material which is undergoing brittle fracture, 
uh, the energy release rate of, of surface, once that is balanced by the release of elastic strain energy, then this crack will propagate all the way through. And bundling is just the reverse, where now you have the um, penalty for bending of the tubes, but if the energy release rate from new van der Waals contacts is higher than this bending energy release rate, then the thing will zip together. And you can turn that into a nice little theory that will, will predict what that critical angle should be in terms of the energetics. Okay, and again, you can, you can um, look at this now in terms of uh, bundling time as a function of length. Adam sort of showed some similar results earlier on, but the crucial bit here is that the bundling times usually are much, much quicker than the collision time. So these bundling times here of order uh, hundreds or thousands of nanoseconds, so far shorter than the average collision time in a dilute system. So um, as he mentioned, tubes basically wander around more or less uh, randomly. They hit each other occasionally, and as soon as they hit, they bundle almost instantaneously. So that raises the question of, of gelation. And I'm going to sidestep that a little bit because in a minute I'm just going to move to fully concentrated solutions. But there is still the to to achieve that, that gelation, but that's a question for another day. So one more thing we need to make a, a good model of this, um, this bundle is friction. So uh, this is um, something which only really arises at the macroscopic scale. So in order to estimate this, we take two atomic tubes and we just drag them across each other at a certain velocity, and then we measure the force required to do this, and then we build a potential that mimics this for our smooth coarse grain nanotubes. And um, this is the, uh, the, the equation that we, we used. It's basically a logistic fit, um, so it's a kind of semi-empirical function. And again, this is implemented in lamps if you want to use it. It's a viscous uh, pair style force interaction, and it just reproduces the fact that the, the, the force here varies non-linearly with the velocity, so it starts out small, and then the faster you drag them past each other, the higher that force is. Okay, so once we've got all those things together, now we can start to produce some structures. And here we're looking at um, arrays that are about one micron by one micron, so these are quite a lot of tubes all together. And I'm just showing you two movies uh, which highlight the difference between the structures that you get on the left-hand side with the van der Waals plus buckling plus friction. And on the right-hand side here, this is if you just use the van der Waals, and you see that the structures you get are very different. The colors, by the way, are related to the bundling parameter that I showed you earlier on. So lighter colors are more bundled. Uh, the redder colors mean less bundled. You can see that if you just have van der Waals without the buckling and friction, there are less um, of these uh, holes in the, in the structure. And this, this one here on the right doesn't look very representative of what you normally see for the film microstructures. If we took a, a zoom in, again, you can see around the junction points here, these are looking quite different, and the junctions look much more realistic when you have the buckling and friction forces in there. So you do need to have these extra forces as well as the stickiness of the tubes. So now we get to the interesting bit, which is applying alignment. So here, again, I'm assuming that we've got gelation, and I'm tuning in the alignment just directly because we can do that in the model. So I'm making the structure on the, on the left-hand side here, moderately aligned, so this is a T2 of 0.6. Remember the maximum value here is one, so one means more or less fully aligned in the horizontal direction, 0.6 is moderately aligned. And then we're gonna let them uh, aggregate and see what happens. Again, the colors here relate to the degree of bundling, and you can see that there's a dramatic difference here. So for low degrees of orientation, we're seeing moderate amounts of bundling, but a lot of junctions and a lot of misaligned tubes on the right-hand side here, we're getting almost complete bundling with these very uh, intermittent junction points with, with large regions of, of void in between them. So this is what I was saying earlier on, that the effects of alignment are not just about how the tubes are, are positioned, but also they can affect the structure of the bundles. And we can see this quite nicely in these plots. So this is showing on the left-hand side the van der Waals energy of our different structures. Now I'm just dialing up the orientation anywhere between completely uniform, which is T2 of zero, up to T1, uh, T2 of one, which is fully aligned. And you can see that uh, the fully aligned structures here collapse very quickly, um, and they reach a much lower energy here. So that means they're much more bundled, essentially, than the ones which are lower orientation. That's not very surprising. But what I found surprising was this one on the, on the right-hand side, where we're looking at the, the probability density of the bundle diameter. So for low orientation structures, you've got a relatively small bundle diameter quite uh, a narrow distribution. And as you increase uh, T2, so increasing the orientation, you see quite a big jump here in the bundle diameter from about six 
nanometers all the way up to about 12, so almost doubling the, the size of the bundles. And this transition region in the middle here with a wide distribution, so obviously some kind of conflict here between the larger and the smaller bundles um, with the extreme degrees of orientation giving you a tighter distribution. So that was, that was something we didn't expect to see. Now we get to the point where we're applying some tensile forces. So here we have a, a nanotube array, again, one micron by one micron. The colors indicate the degree of alignment relative to the horizontal axis. So red stuff is aligned horizontally, blue stuff is aligned vertically. And we're going to apply a tensile force to either side of this array in the horizontal direction. And the structure is periodic in, in all directions. And you can see as we extend it, um, we get more and more of the tubes aligning in the horizontal direction, as you might expect. And uh, because of the periodic boundary conditions, we're not seeing any plasma traction. So um, that was our, our first effort. The one which is looking more realistic is, is this. I've turned off the colors now. And we've also cut the periodic boundaries in the top and bottom surfaces. So you'll see now as I pull on it, you get your Poisson contraction of the network. And we can actually start to observe failure, which is where um, the bundles are pulled apart from each other. And if you didn't know that this was a simulation, you might be tempted to think that it looks quite like what you might see under an SEM if you're doing your, your, your tensile test. So the overall um, time for this simulation is of order about 10 nanoseconds. So the strain rates here are extremely high, of order of 10 to 6, 10 to 7 reciprocal seconds. So much faster than you can do experimentally. But nevertheless, the um, pictures that you're getting are I think quite realistic and this is the first time that we've been able to do this kind of simulation with, with friction and buckling in as well. So from these simulations we can then start to extract some uh, measurable quantities like uh, the um, engineering stress and versus strain and we're doing this here for the different degrees of orientation so um, this is varying the strain rate here again all of these strain rates are extremely high uh, this is just because of the way that the simulation we run, but nevertheless, increasing strain rate from about one times ten to the minus to times ten to the seven up to about five times ten to the seven, you see a large increase in the in the stress as you would expect. Um, but uh, they're all sort of behaving qualitatively similarly. Um, look at the difference if you have a, an orientation of um, t one t two equals one in the horizontal direction. The engineering stresses are much much higher. So again, you see a strain. Um, a strain rate hardening effect, but the uh, overall magnitude of the stresses is higher. So the, the, the strain rate dependence of these um, properties is built into the model. So this is a summary of all of our, our results that we've obtained so far. So plotting elastic modulus, strength, um, strain to failure, and viscosity all versus uh, orientation parameter for three different strain rates. You see that um, in all cases, the, uh, the modulus and the strength, they increase with, um, with T2 uh, exponentially. The uh, modulus is even maybe super exponential when you get to really high degrees of, of order. This is a log scale, so if it's a straight line, that's exponential. If it's lifting up, it's super exponential. And then um, with the case of uh, the strain and the, the viscosity, you're starting to see some drop off here. So at, at, at higher degrees of orientation, um, the material is, is behaving uh, maybe less viscously, so it's getting less tough. And the ordering here of the strain rate dependence is flipped. So uh, higher strain rates give you uh, less toughness and uh, lower strain to failure. So I think I've got enough time just to compare those with some early experimental work. So this was uh, some, some experimental work that Turek Gishban did in a group of Nigel Nagurn in Singapore. So this was using a split Hopkinson bar uh, experiment to go to some high strain rates. We're only going up to about 100 meters per second or 100 reciprocal seconds, which is still lower than what we can do in the, in the simulations. But you can see again that the strength and, and stiffness are, are getting a lot faster as we go, sorry, a lot higher as we go to faster strain rates. And uh, I've got a little movie here just to show. This is one of our fibers um, taken with a, a really fast fan camera. We're going at about 72,000 frames per second here just showing how that fails at these very high strain rates. You can see the failure here on the, on the right hand side. And looking at that failure mode, it looks very reminiscent of the simulations we showed earlier on. So just to summarize then where we've got to with our models, I think we've got this realistic model now of the fiber microstructure. If you want to simulate realistic structures, you need friction and buckling as well as the van der Waals stickiness to get the, uh, the junction and the bundling right. The um, mesoscale model predicts that larger bundle size um, occurs with higher orientation, so it's not just the 
direct effect of the orientation, you have an indirect effect on the bundle size as well. And we get increased strength and stiffness with alignment and strain rate, just as we observe experimentally, but a decreased toughness and fracture strain, uh, failure strain with alignment and strain rate. And further works going on to understand electrical conductivity. I did show some finite element models at the beginning, but uh, we're hoping to revisit that with our with our more sophisticated bundle models. And so if you're coming to NT in France, maybe you have some more work to show then. So let me finish just by acknowledging the groups. This is uh, my group of spinners in material science. Adam and his group um, collaborate with closely, and my two PhD students, Philip Fuller and Philip McKeown, who did most of the work that I've shown you. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.